Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my, my salvation testimony, I was a young child, so I was maybe five years old, so that's not really, you know, I don't have a big story there, but uh, um, I, I do plan on sharing the story of what happened and transpired about just over 11 months ago. And uh, so I know many of you are aware that I had some complications and I almost didn't make it through it, but uh, I'm just going to share that story with you and how God worked through that and, and some of the answers to prayer. So uh, <clears throat> July 14th, actually July 13th, it was Friday the 13th, you know, and uh, my wife goes into labor and I just, you know, on the, on the way to the hospital, she's like, we cannot have this baby on Friday the 13th. So, <laughs> so lo and behold, uh, little Joshua held off and he was delivered at around 1248 on Saturday, July 14th. And uh, so we enjoyed him for a, a couple of hours and uh, about just, just before three, quarter till three, I handed him back to my wife and I, I went back to the chair beside the bed there and I sat down and I, I went to respond uh, to a text that I'd received from a friend of mine and I dropped my phone in my lap. And uh, so I'm sitting there and, and I can hear Carrie say, Brian, are you okay? And that's the last thing. that I remember. So uh, I told myself I wasn't going to do this too. But uh, so um, <clears throat> she called the nurses in and, and they, they got me down on the floor, I guess. I don't know. I was just totally non-responsive. It wasn't something that I felt coming on. I was just there one minute and that's it. That's my memory for three days. It's gone. So, uh, but they, they performed CPR on me, uh, chest compressions. Um, uh, defibrillators, they pulled her in the bed out of the, uh, the delivery room there and, and they took the baby down to the nursery and so my wife was in the hallway <laughs> watching as they performed CPR on me and, uh, and, and she uh, talked to me, you know, <laughs> and she just remembers getting down on her knees and, and praying there in the hallway of the hospital, the delivery area there, and uh, uh, just she recalls a, a nurse, you know, that somebody was asking if she's okay, and, and, and one of the nurses says, no, she just has really great faith. And so I think it's just, you know, a blessing that uh, when you have a wife that has great faith, and, and it's been a blessing to me. So um, at any rate, so they continue to work on, on me, and, and you after about 45 minutes, I guess, I don't know, uh, they, they took me down to the emergency room and uh, they, they continued to work on me there um, through Saturday. They, get, they put me into a, uh, the cardiac ward at Peace River Regional Medical Center. Uh, they put me into an induced coma and uh, having gone back and spoken to the nurses since then, They didn't expect me to make it. So even the nurses there who work in, you know, hospitals and emergency rooms and cardiac units, none of them expected me to make it. And it's my understanding that uh, one of the nurses there in the cardiac ward just kind of suggested to the doctor that they put me on a system called ECMO, which was really developed for premature children whose lungs aren't working. And, and what it does is it pulls the blood out of your body and it removes the carbon dioxide, they add oxygen, and then they put it back into your body. And for adults, they do that through the femoral vein is where they're pulling it out of, and then they're putting it back into the femoral artery. And uh, on doing some research for this, you know, you found that if hospitals don't do this procedure regularly, you know, it's, it's less than a 50-50 chance of survival. And so at Peace River, I'm just guessing that I was the only one they'd ever done it to. Because <laughs> when I went back, they're like, oh, the ECMO guy. So it was so uncommon that even months later that, you know, that's, that's how they still remember me, the guy that was on ECMO. So at that time, they planned to fly me to um, Orlando. At the time, it was uh, Florida Hospital Orlando. Now it's Advent, I think, or something like that. But um, so they put me there. They had a specially designed ward there that was 
just for this kind of issue, just for ECMO, and millions of dollars just for like two, three rooms or something that they had just finished there, just prior to my being there. And uh, so this was on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. They flew me out there. And uh, <laughs> at the time, uh, the church hadn't received word of this, but they had received word of, of everything prior to this. And pastor opened the service for me in prayer. And uh, while I was up there and they had me and they were settling me into my room, it's called a cannula, which, I mean, these tubes that are coming in and out of me are only, to me on pictures, it looks like three quarter inch supply lines for a hose, right, for plumbing. And they're massive hoses and you could just, at any rate, as they were moving me, it, one dislodged from my femoral artery. And uh, I lost so much blood that I coded again. And this was on a Sunday afternoon. They didn't have a surgical crew really on staff to handle that, but they had a, a surgery that was scheduled that day. <laughs> and the doctor was running late. So they had postponed that surgery. So they had a crew there ready and available to take me in and perform the repair on my femoral artery. So I mean, that's just, you know, not even knowing that we needed that kind of a prayer at that time, we were given prayer and God answered that prayer ahead of time. And uh, so it, that was all worked out. And at any rate, so that's Sunday afternoon-ish. And then they, after that, as they were doing that surgery, they realized that my heart function had been restored somewhat, and they were able to take me off of the ECMO completely. Now, when I was in, in the hospital in Port Charlotte, and they did, it's called an ejection fraction, a percent of oxygenated blood, each beat of your heart that's pushed to the rest of your body. For an average person, it's around 55, 60%. Mine at that time was 5%. So, it's like, 12 beats of the heart to get one beat out is essentially what it was for me to get the oxygen spreading. Um, they took me in on Monday morning at Florida Hospital. They did the cardiac catheter, and my heart function was back to normal. So, uh, <laughs> you know, to go through all that, just, you know, a matter of two, three days, and you go from 5%, you know, I heart stopped at least twice. I don't know how many times it stopped throughout the CPR. Um, but God was watching over me, and so they, they took me off the, um, the medications that kept me in a coma, and, and as I came out, I'm, I'm laying in my bed. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to me, but I was calm. It was just a piece that was over me, and uh, I really didn't even have questions about what was going on, really, and uh, you know, I, know, I know there I was intubated, so I had these hoses, tubes, air tubes down my throat, and you know, I was trying to, uh, as I normally do when I have those things, dislodge it with my tongue. And uh, so there's a, a nurse in that room, and in the rooms with the ECMO there, the nurses are in there 24-7. They, they don't leave the room, so you're assigned one nurse. And uh, he, yeah, I have no idea even what time of day it was, but he kept telling me, he's like, don't play with that, you're going to die again. And I didn't even... <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you already died twice, you know, don't make it three times. And, and like... That didn't even seem odd to me. You know, I'm laying in the bed. I have no idea where I'm at, what's going on. And he's like, oh, you died three times. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just the, the peace that God gives you in, in those times is just, you know, I, I, I can't explain it. You know, passes all understanding. It just, you know, it's there. You know, I, I wasn't stressed out. I wasn't fretting. I was missing my wife. I was, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, God is good. He's, even in your times of need, he's there for you. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so I just praise God for that. And um, at any rate, so as we, we moved through that and I was able to, to speak and move and, you know, finally go into a week on Friday, they, they changed my pacemaker out. So now if I have an issue like that, I, I get a little shock. Let me know that I'm still alive there. But, uh, you know, it's... It, it, for me personally, the, the time there, you know, Pastor and, and Brother Yuri and Brother Steele and uh, 
don't want to forget anyone. I think that's it. Like I said, I was in and out, you know. They came down and they visited, and that, that was a blessing. Brother Yuri dropped me off some uh, reading material, you know, uh, Field and Stream, I think, and some firearm magazine. So I was passed a couple days in the uh, <laughs> hospital there. But, uh, you know, my wife was able to come and stay for a few days, and the, the church picked that up. So that, w- that was a blessing that in our time of the need that the, the church family was there. I, I think, I don't know, it just seemed like forever we were eating food that was prepared for by the people in this church. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that, that in our time of need, that my brothers and sisters in Christ here in First Baptist were there for us. And uh, what a great blessing that was. And, um, you know, I just, I thank you all. I praise God. You know, it's, it's kind of, to me, it's, I get emotional when I'm talking about it, but it's, it's not even like, it's kind of surreal for me. You know, it's just kind of, I was there. People tell me, oh, that would be a great story to tell. I think it's kind of boring when I tell it. You know, it doesn't, I try to keep it low key because <laughs> I get all worked up. But, um, you know, I, I will say for those of you who are here and you've not trusted Jesus Christ to be your personal savior, that, uh, you, you know, it can blink of the eye. It's over with. Okay, I, I've had heart problems since diagnosed. I think I was like 31, 32 years old. I'm 46 now. Okay, so this is something I knew of. I'm familiar with the, the flutters and things that go on in my chest. This is not something that I felt. It's just I was sitting in a chair. I'm there one minute. I didn't get tightness in my chest, pain in my arm. It was nothing, and it was just gone. So if you think that, oh, yeah, I know this stuff, and, you know, when... When something happens, I know I can lean back on this. You, you know, don't, don't kid yourself. It's gone before you know it. And if you, you've not, you know, trusted Christ, you know, it's, it's too late. Your, your eternity's settled for you. So I just pray that uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you will trust in him and, and uh, believe on him to be your Lord and Savior. So that's pretty much it. So thank you for listening. Okay. Well, take out your Bibles, if you would, this evening. Turn with me to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. It's been a few weeks since we've been in 2 Peter, uh, so uh, uh, catch you up to speed a little bit, because this week's message really builds off of earlier parts of the chapter. In 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, the whole concept and the thoughts here is of, of you looking ahead uh, to the, uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, he tells us and foretells of the last days and how in the last days there would be those who would deny uh, the return of Christ. They would deny the creation. They deny the flood. Uh, they would believe that all things just continue as they've always been. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking to a man at his doorstep. Oh, he said, there's no God. I said, where did we come from? Uh, I said, uh, just a big bang. And uh, I said, where did the big bang come from? Well, I don't know. You know, they don't really think those things through. Uh, They just don't want there to be a God. And that's what 2 Peter tells us that men would be like. They are willingly ignorant of the flood and of creation. But the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ would return. And as a result, judgment would come. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we discover that the reason the Lord has not yet returned is because he wants to see people saved. And I'm sure we all hear that horn going off right now, don't we? I wonder if we could get a word on who that is. Josh is out there. Maybe he'll let us know so we can cancel the alarm anyway. But it did stop, didn't it? Well, that's good news as we can all focus back on the word of God now. So back to verse number 10, where we see these words, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And so there's the promise, is a certainty. And we saw this a few weeks ago, that the day of the Lord encompasses the return of Christ all the way through his millennial reign, and it concludes with the world as we know it being burned up, being utterly dissolved. Notice it tells us, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So what's going to happen to the world in which we live 
is everything is going to be dissolved. The book of Revelation talks about a new heaven and a new earth with that new Jerusalem that we all will be citizens of when we know the Lord Jesus Christ and we're part of his kingdom. So this is the future. And he's telling us in these verses how that the things that are in this life, the things that are around us that we see today, they'll one day be gone. They'll one day be gone. And having all of that as the background of the chapter, we come to the verses that we're going to look at tonight in verses 11 to verse number 14. And here's what he says. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What things? Well, the things we can touch. This pulpit. This building. This beautiful roof. All of these things will one day be dissolved. And seeing seeing these, that these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Is this the truth? Is this what's on the horizon? Is it true that one day there's a new heaven and a new earth? Is it true that this earth is going to burn up? Is it true that we'll be part of a coming kingdom? No, we saw something true. We say we believe something's true. The truth has ramifications. Truth, in fact, demands a response. If it's true that this building's on fire, then I'm not just going to stand here. I'm going to get out the exit, right? If it's true that there's banana pudding in the refrigerator and it's been offered to me, then you'll know where to find me after the service, all right? I'll be at the refrigerator because truth demands a response. If it's true, then there's something that is going to, it's going to impact me. That's why today we look at the law passed in Alabama where they will prosecute, they said, an abortion doctor. Someone that performs an abortion could spend up to 90 years in prison. And there are people who look at that and say, that's extreme. Well, excuse me, if it's true that life begins at conception, and it does, then abortion is murder. And if it's murder, then the doctors, so-called, who perform an abortion should be punished as if they committed murder. It's not just a political issue. It's not just something we can agree to disagree about. Not if it's true. If it's true that life begins at conception, then they should be punished. That's what God says. In fact, God's punishment is much more, in our world's eyes, extreme than that. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. You know what a just law is, a righteous law? And that is anyone that performs an abortion should be put to death. And maybe if they had their limbs torn off of their bodies the way they tear the limbs off the baby's bodies, we'd see abortion stop right away. You know, that's, you say, whoo, that's extreme. But you know what? If it's true that life begins at conception, then there's ramifications to that truth. Likewise, in 2 Peter chapter 3, here's what Peter's getting at. Since it's true, and it's not a matter of if it's true, since it's true that this world's going to be dissolved, and since it's true that there's a coming kingdom, that if we really believe that truth, then our lives are going to change. And there's several things in this passage that change. The first thing that changes is our lifestyle. Notice in the passage what he tells us. He says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation?" And godliness. Holy conversation. Now, we recognize in English today, when we see the word conversation, we think about communication. And certainly it would apply to our communication, but the King James word conversation speaks not just of what we're communicating with our lips, but what we're communicating by our lives. It speaks of our lifestyle, it speaks of our behavior. That's what the word means if you were to look it up in the Greek, if you were to look up in the Old English, watch this conversation, it's our living, it's our lifestyle. And so the thing is, if we truly believe that Christ could return at any moment, like he tells in verse 10, the day of the Lord will come how? As a thief in the night. Well, it's going to change how we live. If we really believe 
that all that this world one day, uh, the, all that this world offers will one day be gone, that it is going to alter our values. It's going to change how we live. If we truly believe that the ungodly will one day perish, it's going to alter how I communicate with them and how I respond to them. You know, it wouldn't make any sense to say, well, I believe Jesus could come in any moment. I believe that there is an eternal kingdom. I believe I'm a citizen of heaven. And then just live like an average citizen of the earth. That doesn't make any sense. That's what Peter's getting at. He's saying if these things are true, then here's how we should live in light of that coming day of the Lord. Peter explains when these truths are really believed, they alter our lifestyle and our conduct. Notice again, he tells verse 11, it leads to holy living. Holy living. You ever think to yourself, boy, Jesus could come back and that is something that keeps you from doing something you shouldn't do? You ever thought to yourself, well, what if Christ returned and and I haven't made things right with my spouse or I haven't made things right with my brother? You know, I need to make those things right. You ever had those thoughts? Well, that's good. You see, those things ought to cultivate in us a desire to be right with God. If Christ could come back at any moment, you know, so often we put things off. We think we have another chance, right? We have another opportunity. But the reality is, I'm not guaranteed anything beyond this very moment. So it leads us to holy, conver- uh, to holy living. Notice 1 John chapter 3, you find the same thing. When we truly grasp the return of Jesus Christ, the second coming, it always flows out into holy living. If you believe that Jesus Christ is coming, if you believe that you'll live forever in his kingdom, you believe that all of this that the Bible foretells is true, then notice in 1 John chapter 3 what he tells us. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Right now, I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, when we see Jesus, it tells us we shall be like him. We shall be like him. That is what we are predestined to be. If you're saved, the Bible says your destiny is to become like Jesus Christ. You know, right now we talk about Christ's likeness, and that's our That's our goal in the way that we live. Well, when we meet Christ, all of the impurities of our life is gone. And we're made like Christ. We'll be perfect, blameless, holy. Notice it says, for we shall see him as he is. You know, we can't stand in the presence of God unless we're perfect and holy. The Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see God. Well, my holiness isn't good enough. (laughs) But Christ's holiness is given to me. And when I see him, I will be perfect in holiness. I'm not going to be like Christ in his omnipotence. I'm not going to be like Christ in the fact I'm Lord, but I'll be like Christ in the fact that I will be holy and I will be pure. And that is my destiny. Furthermore, notice what he says then in verse number three. Every man that hath this hope in him does what? Purifieth himself even as he is pure. And by the way, you'll notice the word purifieth. It's the idea of a continuous process. You know what? You might be You might have said, yeah, I got right with God, you know, a while back, or I confessed, you know, what I was doing. You know what? It's a continuous process. It's not a one-time thing. You and I, as we go through life, Jesus gave us the illustration when he washed the disciples' feet. He said, when we go down the roads of life, we need that continual cleansing. We need him to wash our feet because we pick up the dirt and the grime of the society and the world around us. We need his continual cleansing, and confession is so important towards that end. And what we notice in 1 John 3 is the same thing in 2 Peter 3, and that is when we have a hope of eternity, when we, pl- when we recognize the truth and we fully grasp the truth that I'm going to be living forever with Christ in eternity, then it manifests itself in holy living, in pure living. You find the same thing in 1 Peter. Look back in 1 Peter chapter 1, because Peter himself, has already touched on this from the very outset in the first letter that he wrote. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13. Wherefore, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Gird up the loins is the idea of don't allow those things that would trip yourselves up. It has the idea of swiftness. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Be serious-minded. And notice the words, hope. Hope is a confident expectation. It's always looking ahead. The hope for thing. And, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at when the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's talking again about when you see him. 
Hope for that. Have a confident expectation. Be looking for that. And notice what it flows out to. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. You notice again, flowing out of verse 13, and the confidence of the hope, the appearing of Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord, of all that God foretells us is coming in the future, of standing at that judgment seat of Christ, all of this expectation, it leads us to a holy life. It's saying, you know what, I want to live for God. And we talk about holiness, and holiness has two parts to it. Holiness speaks of being set apart, set apart from sin. We notice in the passage of 1 Peter chapter 1, notice that we are to be as obedient children, and notice, we could be disobedient children, and when we live unholy life, that is what we're being. But notice, he says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts. No, we've been saved, we ought to live different. There ought to be a difference that is visible in the life of a Christian. One of the saddest things, I think, in America is people have come to see being a Christian means nothing. And people think, hey... If I, a Muslim, well, a Muslim's going to be different, you know? That's what they expect. If I convert to Islam, there's going to be changes. People think, well, if I convert to being a Jehovah Witness, there's going to be changes. Becoming a Christian, eh, I don't have to change anything. Well, that's not genuine conversion. Because the Bible tells if any man's in Christ, he is a new creature. Sounds like a rather radical transformation, doesn't it? You know what? It flows out in the way that we live. And he's telling us here, look, if we're saved... Don't walk according to the former lusts, those desires and cravings that you have before you're saved. What is it that the world desires? Well, they desire to please themselves. They desire just, you know, to gratify their own belly and just to pursue their own wants. They have a lust for prestige. They have a lust for pleasure. As it says in 2 Peter, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They've got a lust for position, and, and they just want to, as the rich fool, uh, take their ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Those are the desires of the old nature. That's not the new nature. The new nature has a desire, and that's this, to do the will of the Father. I want to serve Him. I've got a new purpose. I've got a higher calling. I've got that new desire, those new longings those yearnings within from the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, the word fashioning there in verse number 14 is the same Greek word as the one translated Romans 12 in verse number 2, where we're commanded, be not conformed to this world. It's the same thought in verse 14. Don't fashion yourselves according to the former lusts. You know what a Christian finds as entertainment should be different from what the world finds as entertaining? What a Christian finds as fulfilling should be different from what the world finds is fulfilling. What we're pursuing should be different from what the world is pursuing. Our whole mindset, the way that we think, the way that we look at life, the way that we look at relationships, the way that we consider our time, everything should be different. It shouldn't look like the world. Rather, we should be looking more and more like Christ. We look at this passage and we notice that holiness is, first of all, set apart. It's set apart from, set apart from lust. So there's a cleanliness, a cleansing that's needed in holiness. But there's a second part of holiness. And when we speak of being holy, we speak of consecration. It's not just that in our holy lives, in trying to live a holy life, that we set apart ourselves from the impurities in the world around us, but also that we're set apart unto God. Set apart unto God. I like to use as an illustration of holiness, I like to use my toothbrush. All right? I don't know about you, but I don't like to share my toothbrush. You know, there's a lot of things that I share with my wife. Uh, we'll share a drink, you know, a Coke or whatever. We'll, we'll even share food, and oftentimes we go out to eat, and she can't eat everything on her plate, which just means that I stuff myself even more, you know, uh, those sorts of things. I'll eat after her, and and I'll drink after her. But one thing that we never do intentionally is share a toothbrush. We just, that's still kind of gross. Yes, we're married and 
have 10 children, but I don't share toothbrush. My toothbrush is mine. And worse than, than, uh, than, any, than not is, is occasionally my children have used my toothbrush. You know, there's nothing more alarming than pulling out your toothbrush, sticking it, you know, in your mouth, and it's already wet. You know what I mean? You ever had that happen to you? I think to myself, no, no, you know, this isn't the way this is supposed to be. I remember an evangelist that came through at Pensacola while I was there, and he told a story of when his son was learning to brush his teeth, and his son was short, and he couldn't reach the water up at the sink. And uh, he was uh, uh, brushing his teeth and learning, but he didn't like to brush his teeth. Well, the father kept coming into the bathroom and finding his toothbrush was wet. And he went to his son. He said, have you been using daddy's toothbrush? And the son said to him, he said, no, I, I, I didn't use your toothbrush. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. He went to his wife. She's like, that's disgusting. He went to his daughter. She said, dad, kill me now. I would never do that. He said, what is going on? He would confront his son and his son. And it didn't make sense his son would be using it because he hated to brush his teeth until one day, he found out who was using his toothbrush. It was his son's stuffed Burt doll off of Sesame Street. And the son who couldn't reach the sink was dipping it in the toilet and putting it in Burt's mouth. And all that time, he'd been using that toothbrush that had been dipped in the toilet. You know what? I don't want a toothbrush that's been in the toilet. I want a toothbrush that's dedicated to me and only me. Can I say... You and I are like that toothbrush. God calls us to holiness. He says, I don't want you dabbling in the toilet waters of this world. You belong to me and only me. And you're to be used for me. You know, in the Old Testament, we find holy instruments. There'd be, you know, things dedicated in the tabernacle. And they says these things are holy. You know, we could read about holy oil, holy garments, a holy place. Well, how could things be holy? Well, it's because they were dedicated to God. They said, this is all God's. It's his alone. You know what holiness for us, it carries that same thought. It's saying, I'm for, I'm for God alone. I belong to him. I don't belong to, I don't belong to, to the world. I don't belong to, uh, to my flesh. I don't belong to myself. It's 1 Corinthians 6. It says, wherefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I belong to him. I've been bought with a price. He owns me twice. He made me and he bought me. I belong to God. You know what? As a holy individual, I want to make sure that I am living a life dedicated, consecrated, completely and totally to the Lord alone. That's holiness. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter, it says, you know, and when we really grasp this concept of what is going to come in the future, then we will live a holy, dedicated life. Our lifestyle will be changed. Let me speed this up now. Not only our lifestyle will be changed, but also our likeness. Godliness. It says, notice in verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Godliness speaks of devotion and piety. When I see the word godliness, my mind immediately kind of puts in a, a couple extra letters, God-likeness. I want to be like Christ. I want to be like Him. Again, we take that look at 1 John 3, 2. Our ultimate destination is to be like Christ. I want to be like Him. What is holiness going to look like? We were just talking about holiness. Holiness looks like Christ. We... You know, conjure up idea of, well, if I live a holy life, then, you know, I go off into some far off monastery and, and uh, I spend my day in, you know, uh, Gregorian chants and, you know, separated from the world in those ways and, and having no personality and having no joy. And that's not holiness. You want to see what holiness looks like? Read the Gospels. Because Jesus Christ is the Holy One. And that's what holiness looks like. It's Jesus. You know, it's not this absence of, of, of any personality. It's, it's, the, it's the presence of Christ's personality in me. That's what we looked at this morning. You know, we, we saw the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Levite and the priest. Hey, they would have said they were holy, but they weren't. 
And oftentimes we look at the Levite and the priest and we think, well, that's the kind of holiness that the Bible's talking about. No, it's not. It's Christ. It's the Good Samaritan. One that, yes, is separate from evil, but one who also is full of compassion and mercy and dedicated to the things of God. Jesus Christ, the Holy One. And so we're reminded, 1 Peter chapter 1, if we're going to live a holy life, it's not just that we do holy things. What does 1 Peter 1 say? Be holy. Be holy, for I am holy. And so in this passage, holy conversation and godliness, it's the outflow, again, of Christ in me. I'll just bring it back. Walk in the Spirit. Abide in Christ. Walk with God. And as we walk with Him, you know, we spend time with Christ. The more you spend time with somebody or something, the more you're shaped like them. Iron sharpeneth iron, right? So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Well, the more time I spend with the Lord, the more like the Lord I'm going to be. And I ought to walk with Him. What an invitation. Spend time with Christ. Walk with Him. And holiness will flow out. So these truths are something that impact our likeness, something that impacts our living. We also notice in this passage it'll impact our looking. Notice several times in this passage he speaks of our look. In verse 12 he says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Verse 13, nevertheless we according to his promise look. For new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things. What are you looking for? Remember a question that Jesus Christ has asked, and that is, what seek ye? When the disciples came to him, Andrew and John, what are you looking for? What is it that you want? You know, for you and I, we could ask the same question. The Lord could ask us tonight, what are you looking for? What is it that you want? What are you longing for? You know, here in this passage, we see that we've got to be looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. And that hasting has the idea of, of, of that longing and, and excitement. The Bible tells us that Zacchaeus, when he was told by Jesus that Jesus was going to come to his house, that Zacchaeus made haste. Well, that was exciting. Why? Because he wanted to be with Christ. You know what? It's the same thing for us. Do you want to be with Christ? You know, I, I know for, for me, one of the things that I hear from my kids all the time, we take a long trip, and we move to South Florida. Every trip we take seems like a long trip, huh? We're down here. We're way down here. I get calls from missionaries all the time. So, yeah, we'll be in Florida. I was like, well, you know how far down in Florida we are? Well, I'll be over in Pensacola. Hey, we're an eight-hour drive from Pensacola. We're way down here. And so any trip that we take is a long trip, and almost always especially before the advent of, you know, electronics where they go into zombie mode, you know, on the long trips. But, but the kids aren't on their electronics. They're like, how much longer, right? How much longer? There's two reasons they ask. Number one is they're tired of the journey. They're tired of the journey. You know, I think that there's a very real element of that in us longing to be with Christ and looking for his return. You ever get tired of this world? You ever get tired of the way things are? You get tired of cancer? You get tired of, of the wickedness in our society to where you just say, Lord Jesus, please come. I'm just tired. I want to be a part of that kingdom where all this is a thing of the past and all those sorrows are wiped away. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But you know, there's another aspect of it. It's not just that our kids, when they say that, how much longer, are sick of the ride. But it's also that they're excited about where we're going. They're going to see Grandpa and Grandma. They're going to be at Grandpa and Nona's house with the pool. You know, they're going to go somewhere exciting. They get to be with family, get to be with friends. And so when they say, how much longer? It's because they're looking ahead and they can't wait to where they're going to be. When it talks here about looking for the day of the Lord, well, there's a part of it, it's that excitement. Are you excited about being with Jesus? Are you excited about being in heaven? Are you excited? You know, a few years ago, I started thinking more about the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And being back on this earth before it's destroyed when Jesus reigns in perfect righteousness. Want to be something 
to be in, I don't know what the United States of America is going to be called, but to be walking across this land and for it to be perfect? Wouldn't it be something to be back here and Jesus Christ on the throne? Well, that's something I think about. When I think about being a part of that society. You know, we don't have to worry about crazy new laws that are being passed or, or these uh, uh, diabolical judges and all of their rulings. We don't have to worry about any of that. But instead, we get to be here. You know, I enjoy wildlife. And uh, I'll be able to swim in the canals then and not have to worry about the alligators. They're not going to eat me. I could ride an alligator if I wanted to. I could have a pet alligator. Do you know Thomas Edison's son had a pet alligator? He took with him up north. Anyway, uh, I don't know where that came from, but that's what it's going to be like in the millennium. The Bible tells us the lion will lay down with the lamb. All these things, but just to be with Jesus, to be with my creator, to hear his voice, to hear him speak. And we find in the Old Testament in Solomon's day, the Queen of Sheba came and visited, and she just remarked, she said, you know, the half was not told me. And one of the things that she remarked about was how all of his servants served him with joy because they sat under the wisdom of King Solomon. And I think to myself, how much more so in the millennium to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ and to sit under his joy and his compassion and his love, and to be part of that kingdom. Oh, what a day that'll be. What a day that'll be. Can you imagine getting with some of these that have passed on and the embrace when we get to the other side to see my, on Father's Day, to see my grandpas again, sang that song this morning about the words that they shared and the final goodbye. I can still remember my final goodbye with both my grandpas. One day, there's not going to be any more great goodbyes. It's going to be one long, hello, and that day's coming. You know what, looking for that day, what a day that will be. What a day we sing that song, looking. You know, when we grab hold of these thoughts in 2 Peter 3, and, and I could go on and on, but 2 Peter chapter 3, when this truth really, really goes into our heart, that, you know what, Jesus Christ could come any moment. And that kingdom that he's going to bring in one day is going to last for forever. And this world's going to pass away. You know what? It changes our living. It changes our likeness. It changes our looking. What am I looking for? Who am I wanting to please? What world am I living for? You know what? Think about the rapture. Think about heaven. Think about being with Jesus. Those truths will change our lives. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Lord, thank you for your soon return. Lord, your promises, the promises of the return, promises of a kingdom, promises of a new heaven, a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Father, we're excited about that. Lord, you know how easy it is for us to get distracted Lord, we're strangers and pilgrims so often, Father, we act like we're residents here. I just pray, Lord, do a work in our hearts and in our minds, in our thoughts. Lord, set our affections on things above, the things to come, that we might be looking ahead and living for your kingdom. Lord, bless us tonight, we pray. Do this work in us for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all just...